Hi, I'm Caleb. I'm a cardist, and I'm interviewing other cardists to see how and why they create, so we can learn how to grow as a community. Welcome to Cardistry Talk. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Cardistry Talk. This is episode 28, and today I'm joined by Trent C. You may know him from his Instagram account. You also may know him from his performance with Best Cardist Alive, The Fourth Dimension. I'm super excited to have him on the show and to talk about cards. Uh, Trent, thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to have you. I hope people will gain a lot from this talk, and I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to hear your perspective on cardistry um, based off what I've seen from your performances and just your moves in general. Um, the first thing I want to do is I want to make sure to hit up the viewer questions because I've been doing really bad at getting these. Um, <laughs> I keep missing and forgetting to, to ask these. So I'm just going to start with these to start off with. But Eric Karnstri asked, what were your goals for the year? Um, well, obviously, there's my plans aren't concrete at the moment. I definitely want to do more edits. Like I just uploaded an edit like a few minutes ago. And I want to keep doing that because I've been having a lot of fun making those. And I am planning on doing a big video this year, probably around, I want it to be a big performance video, probably around 15 moves at least. And I was also debating on um, trying to enter the funding trials. Um, and then there's someone else. I'm not even going to try to pronounce their account name <laughs> because I will butcher it. But um, do you have it? They asked if you had any pet peeves in cardistry. I don't think I have any that come to mind at the moment. I think I kind of share the same pet peeve as Beckett, where I know he doesn't like it when people float while doing their moves, which is moving their hands extensively. And I, yeah, I, I completely agree with um, that. And I think the only people who can get away with it are people like Carter whose style relies a lot on body movement and mm -hmm. hand movement. But yeah, I think that's all I can think of at the moment. Yeah. And then I think the rest of these will probably cover in just the generic talk. Cause like there's stuff like, what is the creative process? And obviously we'll go over that. But I just want to make yeah. sure I hit those questions because I have not lately, <laughs> but um, just, jumping into things and I guess jumping into that with the creative process. Um, I really like asking this question because everybody has a different process, a different idea. I always come with something different whenever we talk about this, but if you had a way to describe your creative process, how, how would you go about it? Well, the majority of moves that I do are usually packet cuts, which, um, well, most people say that, um, the creative process around packet cuts revolves around finding an opener and going from there. Although I have played around with different ways of approaching packet cuts, as in I have tried conceptualizing them and then creating them. And I have tried like, um, this is something that's just come along recently, but I have tried playing around with like certain moments that I want to use in a packet cut and intentionally building up to that moment from an opener, which has given me very interesting results, but I think, I still think the most effective way and the mo most natural way I create is just through finding an opener and going naturally from there. Cause um, like I said, the past few months, I have been trying to go about creating moves by um, having this concrete image of um, this moment I wanna use within that move and building up until that moment. But that has not worked out as well as I thought it would. And that led me to experience one of the worst creative blocks I've ever had, which lasted pretty much the um, entire last month. But I think I'm out of it now, and I think I'm starting to create it more naturally, which is great. Um, and yeah, I think that creating with a moment in mind can work, but it's extremely, extremely difficult. And I think I've nailed it only once with my move muzzle flash which was my entry to the um car street touch contest mm -hmm. and for that one i had an opener which i was playing around for a while i also had a moment in mind before i created it and somehow through a miracle i made it happen in like a day like um 
I sat down and I was like, okay, I'm going to start from this opener and I'm going to get to this moment where the packet slides along the perch and it's going to happen. And I sat down and it did somehow. I don't know how, but it has not happened since, which is a bit sad, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I, I feel like when you have like, not necessarily structuring, creating the move around a moment, but when you do have a moment, it makes the move more memorable. Like there's a lot of packet cuts that look really great, but then you kind of forget about them pretty soon afterwards. I don't know if you, you feel that way. When, when I watch personally though, when I, when I watch a lot of packet cuts, I, I usually forget about them unless they have like a specific moment in there, like something like to wow you. I feel like this is something Lars does really good. Like yeah, he has like, a specific moment within his cut that you remember. Um, yeah, but that's great. I, I think, like I said, everybody kind of has a different process and it's always changing. Um, like I know Ben Cheryl, Cheryl Cartistry said that he usually likes to have like a opening and a closer and then he connects them. Which, that's really interesting. Which is like something I've never even like, I don't even know how, how that would work. <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's um, always interesting to, to hear about people's um, creative process. And then you, you would consider yourself more of a packet cutter, right? Yeah, definitely. I like I have experimented with a good amount of moments, but I feel like my field of area is packet cuts and will always be packet cuts just because I enjoy them more. Mm -hmm. there's, there's just so many possibilities, right? Like exactly. And um, yeah, I did respond to like um, a question similar to this on my story a while ago. And well, I pretty much concluded that the reason I love packet cuts so much is because of how much detail you can put into them. Like I, it's almost like you're a film director and you're making a movie and um, each scene in a movie is a phase of a move and the fun thing about that is you can throw in as many Easter eggs as you want. So like you, your move can be a Marvel film if you want with like as many Easter eggs as you like, like crammed into it. And that's what I love about packet cuts is like every time I look at a packet cut or like a complex packet cut, like Sibs or Greg's packet cuts, I always pick up something different about it each time I rewatch it. And there's so much um, replay value to packet cuts, especially. Whereas um, when we're looking at moments, not to um, not to discredit or not to talk down on people who specialize with moments because I have so much respect for them. But when usually when we're looking at moments, it's almost like a one and done type situation where like you see you it's a very straightforward uh, point and you get it right away. And um, obviously there's some replay value there too, but um, personally, I prefer back cuts. Mm -hmm. it, it almost seems like with the moments, I'm thinking about it and what you're saying right now too. It's very like um, instantaneous. Like you get the more, you get enjoyment out of it instantly. Whereas packet cuts, you can um, kind of enjoy it slowly over time. You can come back to things. I know for me personally, I always go back to grotesque, uh, the video by Taylor's Grip. That's like my favorite video. Every time I go back to it, I'm always like mind blown by something different. Um, yeah, grotesque especially is such a good example of that because, dude, Oliver is fucking nuts. I mean, I'm uh, sorry, I can curse, right? Yeah, yeah, is that all right? Yeah, Oliver is fucking nuts, dude. And everything that he makes is like an instant masterpiece. Like, um, and especially with the grips and hand motions he uses, there's like I said, there's always something to pick up every time you come back to look at it. And the first time I watched Grotesque, I don't think I fully picked up on every um, small regrip and appreciated everything. But it took me like a full year, I think, to like be like, this video is fucking mind blowing. Like, obviously, I thought that when I first watched it, but I, I like I held it to such a higher value um, coming back to it um often there's just so many that like like beckett and 
I know I, I've been looking at Greg's stuff again, and then I watched like a ton of Sib's stuff for last week when I interviewed him. But like, it's so cool like to see something you've already seen and then have a different experience with it than the first time. And I think that's something that's a little bit unique to packet cuts in, in general, not just in the terms of cardistry, but in terms of like life, you know? Yeah, of course. Um, so, so what do you think some of the differences, well, we kind of talked about this, but what do you think some of the differences in, are between the moment moves and packet cuts? I think like I was talking to someone else about this too, but I think it's a lot harder to get started with moments than it is to get started with packet cuts, but it's a lot harder to get good at packet cuts than it is to get really good at moments. And by that, I mean, um, since packet cuts are such a standard thing these days, um, someone can um, like pick up a deck and start cardistry and instantly get into opening the deck in different positions and creating a packet cut from there. Whereas a moment move takes a lot of conceptualization, which is what, um, what um, I see packet cuts don't require sometimes is um, like for moments, especially you most of the time, you, you like have a picture in mind of what you want to happen and you make it happen with a spread or a pharaoh. Whereas when it comes to packet cuts, everything comes naturally. And um, yeah, it like I said, it like, especially um, playing around with like more difficult grips and learning what fits and um, what doesn't fit, how many beats should come with a move or, um, what like what good structure looks like or there's so many different components that come with making a packet cut and what make it good what makes it good you know mm -hmm. and in in that sense it's a lot more difficult to um accumulate the knowledge to identify that each time you make a packet cut than it is to make a moment because usually when when you make a good moment you know you make a good moment you know like there isn't um and that's what's great about moments is that um when you make a good moment there, you don't you really don't need to question it because it if it's a good moment you know it's a good one and you know it's a banger move instantly whereas when it comes to packet cuts you kind of need to go back and remaster small details and revisit stuff and practice it a lot yeah and with packet cuts too like you can feel like you have the flow down really good and you have like um, you kind of have it thought out and then you take a video of it and then it, it looks completely different than what you had imagined or yeah. um, it, just a different angle too can like drastically change what you think of um, for a packet cut, which is interesting. Exactly. And, the, um, like, like you said, there's just so many variables because there's so many possibilities with those types of, of moves. Yeah. I've actually um, struggled more with packet cuts than I would say moment type stuff um and part of that is as i just don't have as much time to sit down and work out packet cuts because they take so long or at least to make like pretty good ones whereas like moments like you said like you just have an idea and then you kind of make it happen so yeah. i don't know why that is but i i'm definitely not at the level that like you or some of these other guys are at um, and then what, what do you think makes a packet cut unique and stand out compared to all the rest? I mean, I think that can vary based on what you're looking at. Like, um, if it's, especially when you're, you can pick up on smaller things in packet cuts, there's like so much that you can take in at once and something that might make a move stand out might be an interesting regrip or what I've been playing around with or noticing in a lot of moves is interesting hand motions. And I think someone like um, Oliver and Leo, um, people like Oliver and Leo really know how to use hand motions in a cut well. Like um, if you take a look at Oliver's feathering, you can see that the guy, like the guy completely stretches his hand out in the middle of the cut. And 
that's the main moment is his hand stretching out to allow the packets to fall around each other. And similarly with Leo, who just tosses in um, these um, hand motions, like I know in forklift, he there's a moment where he goes into an okay sign as he's um, holding the middle grip, which I love so much, just picking up on those like small hand motions or symbols. Yeah, I think that's definitely something. Or another thing would be range of motion. I know, especially on um, beginners, really pick up when there's a huge range of motion in a packet cut or when there's a huge outstretching um, movement or yeah, motion that's going outward or stretching outside of the structure of the packet cut. Um, another thing that comes to mind right now is rotations and especially rotations because obviously who doesn't like spins, right? Mm -hmm. And also um, that's something else that beginners pick up on really easily is um, you see spin in a move or spin anywhere really and you think it's cool. Like there's a reason that um, when you do padiddle and it doesn't properly padiddle, you're like really unsatisfied because th that's just how your brain works. You know, like you see a clean rotation, your, your brain registers it as something cool. And I think that um, applies really well to packet cuts. Like when, even if it's just a small rotation with like um, a rev motion or a reverse rev motion in a packet cut and your brain picks up on it, it's like, that's already a standing out motion. And that's something that just, that small rev motion is something that I've been, that I find myself using a lot in my packet cuts, just because I know it looks cool. And also because I don't know, like my hands almost naturally execute the rev motion with a packet attached to it or something. Like if you go back and look at some of my moves, you can see me like do that rev motion in different positions. And a good example of um, a rotation in a packet cut is, I know my friend Shaz one has a move called um, Galaxy Collapse in which the main motion is literally a packet turning 180 degrees in the middle of the structure, which just looks unreal. And also another one that comes to mind at the moment is Bram's um, Tachycardia, which um, the yeah. main motion pretty much revolves around a rotation that pushes the mechanics into place, which I really, really like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and like you said with the range of motion earlier, I think we were all at some point when we first started, we kind of felt like with the scissor cut or Charlie air cut, like even the most basic stuff now, at one point that was like extremely difficult for our range of motion on our fingers. At least I imagine it is for most people because most people complain about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then, and then we have people like Oliver who's taking it even a step further that like, like I don't, like another thing that was really impressive about grotesque, and I, I'm, I keep coming back to this, but is like he, not even the parts with cardistry, but where he's just like stretching out his fingers, like the range of motion he shows there. Like I can't like, I can't do whatever the heck he did <laughs> where he was like yeah. interlocking them. Yeah. Like it's, it's really cool. And I think like that range of motion shows through and being able to be able to reach uh, different heights when it comes to cardistry. Um, yeah. And I wonder too, if like people that do like um, finger tutting, I think it's called, if like they would um, like Hector Garcia, um, do yeah. you know him, like that video? Yeah, of course. Like, I think those people would, if they were to switch over to cardistry, like they would be able to do some really cool stuff potentially. Um, and be really good at it as well because they yeah. have that range of motion. Yeah, that's really interesting. Like, um, so like thinking about it now, I think it would be different just because you're you you're gonna have to get accustomed to a completely different set of grips and stuff. But that would be an interesting way of thinking. And also to add on to um, just packet cuts that utilize a range of motion really well is hothead two especially because, um, well, Hothead by itself is just an interlock, right? But the moment, and the moment you see um, Tobias and Mix08 stretch into the Hothead position, you're expecting his motion to be very uh, confined just because it's an interlock. And naturally you can't move your fingers as much in an interlock, right? But the moment the packet slides through and like down that like 
rail of motion, mm-hmm. you're like completely mind blown because you're not at all expecting that packet to slide freely through the other one. And that's another great example of um, how a range of motion can be extremely um, impressive in a packet cut. Mentioning the rotations and stuff too, I, I think that's kind of like just like, like you said, it's something our brains do kind of naturally. I think when we see like a circle spinning, we're immediately like hypnotized, like we're hypnotized by that type of stuff, um, both literally and figuratively. Um, and that's why I, I always like really like circle backs um, because you can yeah. like, you have something s- to stare at, like a space still. Um, but yeah, I, I agree completely with that. And like it just adding that motion to can add so much to a cut in the way it looks instead of just being kind of stagnant and having one piece rotating it turns it into a completely different piece because it's almost like um like cogs or gears at that point exactly that's a great analogy yeah that's exactly it and it's not even just on on this axis it's also with like um whether it be like hinge moves with like hinge packets or corner spin moves which also come off as really impressive because it's still rotation, but in a different context. Um, so, so one question I do have for you is, is what, what are kind of some of your hobbies outside of cardistry? Um, I know when I, when I do research on people, I, I usually try to get as much information as I can. Um, and for you, all I could really find is cardistry. So I'm interested to know what you like to do outside of cardistry. If, if anything, maybe you're just a cardistry guru. Well, outside of cardistry, I... I do play a lot of different sports. Like um, I'm a big tennis guy. Usually my main sport is tennis, but I have played, I do play a lot of soccer. Soccer is really, really fun to play. And squash, golf. uh, I used to swim a lot when I was little, but yeah, I usually um, cycle around different sports that I'm used to, but um. To be honest, I don't really um, do or practice any other art form. Like I used to draw a lot when I was little, but I've kind of, that's kind of trailed off. I was into music. Like I used to play piano, electric guitar, classic guitar, and electric bass, but that trailed off as well. So yeah, it's pretty much cardistry in terms of art forms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I always like to ask that because, like, I feel like for, for cardistry specific, there's a lot of overlap with musicians and then, um, like, playing, like, art. Um, but I always like to see, like, where people might be drawing their inspiration from, whether they realize it or not, you know. Um, and that's and that's great that you cycle through a lot of stuff um, and and... I think even when it comes to sports and things like that, you can still draw things from them, whether you realize it or not. Um, I've talked about this a lot. I don't know if you know this, but I, I, I do soccer a lot. Um, yeah. And I, I try to incorporate a lot of that into what I do. But um, it's just, it's interesting, like the inspiration we get, whether we realize it or not. Yeah. Like um, I can definitely relate to the soccer thing because I think around my second year of cardistry, I was really obsessed with footstalls, like, and for the exact like same reason that you are, because I have so- a soccer background. So like naturally, I wanted to incorporate that in somehow, and I was just do- trying to do footstalls nonstop, and I wanted that to be like my thing, but never worked out. Mm-hmm. It's I've played so- around so much with footstalls, and I've made like a ton of little variation but it all ends up being the same thing where you're like slowly at the end you're always slowly letting something on your foot like yeah, slowly that's... slowing the descent of it down and yeah like i want there to be some something else incorporated with it to make it more relevant and to like be capable of being used in like an everyday hardest scenario like something like what i really want to try to do eventually is somehow incorporate like a move that incorporates the whole body or like that actually 
makes sense and isn't like a gimmick. If that that's really sense. interesting because like at that point it's almost juggling but like yeah or dance but i think like if that if we could figure out how to extend outside of our hands and incorporating um like just even the forearms like with when berger does the ouch um, i think it's called ouch where he does that like yeah conceptually it's not like super crazy but the fact that no one's done that before like it was mind blowing like it is mind yeah like yeah especially with ouch like that move is basic physics really like um and it's based off of another move by matt i'm blanking on the name but matt had a move that used the same concept but yeah it's really impressive because he's using his arm and he's not using his hands like if he just had the packet sitting on his hand and he bopped his hand obviously that wouldn't be as cool but he's going from his arm onto his hands which is sick and a person who can use his body really well, where I think like the only person re- pretty much that can do that extremely well is Carter at the moment. Like, um, and that literally goes with any move he makes. He uses his body and accentuates it through his motions. But a good example of a Carter move that uses the entire body, um, well, the, obviously all of his moves do, but um, a great example is running taboo i'm not sure if it has like a name but he does this variation of his move taboo in his um fontaine trials round three video where he literally swings both of his arms forward and it creates this huge range of motion once again but it creates this huge range of motion and that's really impressive to watch and carter has talked about this on various streams but he said that if you do the move and you don't get fully into it with your body, it's not going to look, you're going to look stupid. And it's true. Yeah. It'll be interesting seeing how that kind of progresses. Cause I, I do think we're going to come to a stalling point. I don't know if it'll, I don't think it'll be soon, but eventually like packet cuts won't be as exciting. I don't think. And, and maybe I'm wrong on that. Obviously I hope I am, but I do think like as an art form, Carter Street is going to have to progress slowly into growing even more um, ways of doing it. Um, and like, I have no clue what that'll be. Like, it'll be slow progression, but um, I don't know where I'm going with this. I totally lost train of thought. <laughs> yeah, I completely understand what you're saying, but um, like, I, yeah, I understand what you're saying. And um, I do think that an art form obviously comes with evolution, but hmm. I'm trying to think now and I really don't see us progressing past packet cuts. If I like, because I don't know, like I think packet cuts will always be the main thing that beginners will always get into it, just because like I said, it's really easy to get into, but I do think we're going to see a progression in trends and packet cuts, especially with grips or like, um, I know something that's really um, that's gone really big recently is perching, mm-hmm. like, um, and that's literally all because of Pat Patrick and his vid his video um, selfish that he dropped in January of last year, and he had that one crazy perch move with um, that's called V for Vernavis, where he perches he uses a packet to move another packet without directly touching it. And I think that just spawned a wave of um, people per- like trying to use um, a perch, a perch and a move somehow. And I think we are going to see progression in trends in car street like that. But, um, but I'm not sure if packet cuts are going to ever stop being like the biggest um, genre of car street. Like maybe in like, a couple hundred years <laughs> but uh, yeah yeah there, it's literally too uh early to tell just because um it's car she is like two decades two decades old it's like really young still oh yeah like as a as a hobby or art form it's like genuinely potentially the youngest like thing out there for the most part like even if you look at like film and like like those have been around for like centuries now or close to it um 
it'll be really interesting to see how things progress because especially um with how much it's grown in the past five years like it's grown uh, immensely comparatively to when it first started out um so it'll be interesting to see how things progress and like like you said what what will be trending and what will be kind of the popular thing that people are are working on yeah um it's really interesting too that like one singular move can kind of start that like, like you say with the the v for barnabas and um what noel heath has done a couple of times as well um can completely start changing the way we think about crush and the way people create yeah like literally his table moves just spawned a wave of table moves because um obviously table moves were a thing before but after XCM, when Noel first showed, um, first showed like those two table moves, everyone just started like creating stuff based on that. And if you remember the year, literally the year after, Sib and Matt had a part in the Fontaine Futures video that was revolved around them using the table. And I found that so sick and that inspired me to create so many table moves. And another trendsetter really is... Um, something I already talked about, but Hothead 2. Like having a packet slide freely along with the other one, which mm -hmm. is, I guess, if um, I think about it, is a type of perch in a sense, just on a different plane. But have, yeah, having that packet slide along another or um, like continuing the, the range of motion past what someone would expect also kind of spawned a wave. Like um, Obviously, no one can execute that as well as Tobias can, and that was the reason why it wasn't as big. But another example is Julian Stibber's um, Sagittarius A, I think it's called, where he has a packet between a V structure, and he moves it through, um, through the V structure just by sliding the packets across. And yeah, I thought that was really cool because that was really the second biggest instance of someone using that in the move mm -hmm. i think chase duncan has done a little bit with that too um i uh, first off his stuff's just crazy but um uh, i love i love what he plays around with when he does carter street chase is crazy because um like chase is one of those people who uses rotations really well like especially on with corner spins and stuff. And um, I think something that Chase understands really well in his pack and cuts and something that like I never see him having an issue with is balance within a pack and cut. And just um, he, like everything he puts out is so well balanced. And by that, I mean like there is um, like, I'm not sure if, um, if you understand what I'm saying, but whenever you're looking at a pack and cut, you can, and looking at the general structure of a packet cut, you can tell whether or not it's balanced because mm -hmm. usually if a packet cut isn't balanced, it would be very right heavy, as in most of the packets would be um, concentrated on one side of the move. Or maybe there would be motions pointing towards one side of the move and it would be concentrated in that sense. But Chase balance everything, balances everything out so extremely well throughout all of his moves and throughout the entire um, the entire um, length of his moves. And I find that really inspiring and interesting. Mm -hmm. I think what, what, what that accumulates to too, is like uh, on some packets, you'll have that extra, that extra card or that extra packet on either side. And then like subconsciously in your mind, you're like, why is that necessarily there? Or why is that a part of it? Um, exactly. Whereas his, like every packet seems to have a purpose. Like there's no dead packet. There's yeah. there's always something moving, um, yeah. which is something I think he does really well and why it's like so hypnotizing. It kind of has, like we talked about before, that kind of gears and cog effect where everything is affecting everything. Um, yeah. And um, to interject, um, that would be one of my pet peeves is um, dead packets. I do not like dead packets with the moves. Like um, I... Yeah, I, if a base packet is there throughout the entire move and it doesn't move at all, I'm it bothers me. <laughs> but if, like, usually I'm really impressed by someone who can still, like, will break, like, the general rules and still have a really, really good move and all. 
So I welcome people to try it out. But usually, like, my my rule is every packet needs to move an equal amount. Like, d- d- um, dead packets just bother me for some reason. Yeah. And I think we're starting to establish, like, like rules like that that necessarily aren't 100% of the time correct. But, like, we're starting to get ideas of like what we dislike about cardistry and the things that we do like like when it comes to rotations um really liking those and and things like that which makes it a little bit easier to create when you have an idea of what will make something look good and what will make something look bad whereas i think when i first got into cardistry seven years ago um i don't think that those were quite established yet um and like we were just creating whatever to create whatever but now we've progressed to the point where like moves constantly are coming out that are are really good like the base the base level of quality has jumped significantly is what i'm trying to say um because i I was out of cardistry for a a long time and i came back to it and and the quality of cardistry has jumped like exponentially high um part of that is just having more access to like tutorials and it's easier to learn but I think also part of that is just that we've been around long enough to know what, what looks good and what doesn't and the reasons why we're starting to figure those things out. Yeah. And I think um, to circle back to what we were talking to earlier, I think it takes someone to break the rules of um, just move packet cutting or moves in general and to break them in a good way and still have the move work extremely well to advance an art form or to establish a new trend, like especially with hothead, um, interlocking and then breaking the interlock that quickly should not work, but Tobias does it and he does it so well. And um, and he literally has that as the main moment of the move. And another example is um, Nikolai's Niseko, where he it, it starts off as a four packet cut but he closes the um, fourth packet instantly to advance the motion of the move forward. So he uses um, the fourth packet that he splits off to rotate onto another, onto um, the base packet, I believe, in order to um, push the direction of the move into um, the interlock or like the weird sequence that he has in the middle. And that's another example of um, breaking a rule and doing it well. So at the end of the show, I like to do what I call the rapid round of questions. And what that is, is just three minutes. And the goal is to answer as many questions as possible. Do you have a favorite move? Um, one that comes to mind at the moment is Greg's Gem and Wise. Uh, favorite band musician? Uh, Brockhampton. What would the title of your autobiography be? Just Trenton. Trenton. Uh, cats or dogs? Dogs. Um, if you could add any word to the dictionary, what would it be? I'll go cheesy and just go with cardistry. Uh, do you have a favorite restaurant? Yes, a sushi place down my road down the road nice uh android or iphone iphone summer or winter winter what would your absolute perfect day be me spending um a set amount of time outside and inside doing cards like maybe at the beach or playing tennis Mm -hmm. cards at the beaches the ref. Uh, cats or dogs? Dogs. Do you have a favorite movie? The Hangover. <laughs> um, does pineapple belong on pizza? Definitely not. Uh, pancakes or waffles? Waffles. Have you ever broken a bone? No. If you could have coffee with any Disney character, who would it be? Goofy. (laughs) Um, 
do you have a favorite deck of cards at the moment? Uh, Symbols by Deal Trip. Uh, Coke or Pepsi? Coke. If an actor portrayed you in a movie, who would you want it to be? Ken Jeong from The Hangover. <laughs> um, do you play video games? No, not frequently. Good. It's, it takes a lot of time. Um, favorite type of food? Sorry, what was that? What is your favorite type of food? Of move? Of food. Of food, Japanese. Japanese. Who is the most famous cardist you've met? I have met two, three cardists in total in person, so I'm not sure if I can't answer that, but um, Poet Pun, who's also another Thai cardist. So Trin, thank you for being on the show and taking your time to talk about uh, this wee thing called cardistry. Um, at the end of the show, I like to do what I call roll out the close-up pad, and that's just my way of saying, is there any Thing that you would like to promote or any last nugget you'd like to leave the audience with. i don't think i have anything i want to promote but i do want to shout out uh greg and bram obviously who were on the podcast before me and who pretty much were the deciding factor to me being on this podcast and also my friend adam moshkovich and yeah everyone that i've had a good relationship with on um, Instagram and the Carter Street scene. Thank you for coming on this show. I appreciate it. As always, I'll have links to Trent's stuff in the description if you guys want to check him out if for chance you don't know who he is. Um, yeah, I hope everybody has a great day and I hope you guys enjoyed. We'll see you guys later. Peace.